Hi everyone, my name is Jay Kim and I am putting together two videos to help people learn the basics of surf perch fishing on the Oregon coast. These videos are for beginners, so it won't help you much if you've already been out a few times. I'm an assistant moderator for a Facebook club called the Oregon Surf Perch Fishing Group, where we try and help fellow members learn to catch surf perch. Both of these videos are broad overviews and don't cover a lot of detail and subtleties of surf perch fishing, which you will learn as you get more experienced at it. This first video will explain critical things you should know before you go out into the surf to fish. The second video will, fo will focus on how to fish for surf perch, covering various topics like gear, fishing techniques, bait, and other resources to learn from. Hope you learned something by watching these. These are my disclaimers. What I present are just my own opinions and you are responsible for making your own decisions. I'm no expert and there is no one best way to fish and I get skunked many times. It's all personal preference and choices. I've learned by watching a ton of YouTube videos and through my own personal experiences trying different things. I've also fished with many anglers on the Oregon coast. I have learned a lot from asking questions, but I'm still learning. You are responsible for your own safety and making sure you are adhering to all state laws and regulations. Learn to check for safe ocean conditions and stay up to date on all laws and regulations. Don't rely on what people tell you. Check for yourself. Ocean and weather conditions change daily, so keep watch closely if you're planning on going. I go about 60 times a year, so I can be picky under which conditions I go. If you work and only have weekends, obviously, obviously you're not always going to have ideal conditions to fish. I'd like to tell you about the Surf Perch Club I help moderate, as it's an excellent resource for any surf perch angler to be part of, regardless if you're a seasoned surf percher or just starting out. Of course, you need a Facebook account to join, and the other restriction is that it's only for Oregon residents. The club sell funds through merchandise sales and through very generous donations by members. So we give away a lot of free stuff several times a year. We give away custom made rods, weights, hooks, and many other free gear and merchandise. And there's no charge to enter the raffles. Fellow members are very willing to help others learn and often will meet often will meet strangers to help them catch. I do this all the time. There are also frequent fishing reports. We also do meet and greets just to hang out. And there are lots of people who help fellow members out by sharing lots of information. And we also have a YouTube channel where we post short videos. Here's the Facebook link. To repeat, this is a two-part video series, and the current video you're watching is part one of two. In this video, I'll tell you things to know before you go out. You need to be legal, you need to be safe, how to have an enjoyable experience, how to analyze conditions using forecast, what you can catch, and then I'll close the video. In part two, I'll go over how to fish in the surf. I'll talk about rods and reels, tackle, rigs, bait, Go over miscellaneous tips and tricks, summarize the two videos, and close. So here's a minimal list of what you'll need to start fishing in the surf. You'll need a valid state fishing license. You'll need a rod and reel. You'll need basic tackle to rig up your rod and reel. You need bait. And all, although waders are not required, they're very highly recommended. You also should have a way to contact 911 in case of an emergency. You should be aware that phone coverage can be spotty on the coast, so I just bought a VHF radio to be able to contact people in case I need help. And there are many other items that could be recommended like food, water, first aid, personal medicine, sunscreen, but everyone has to come up with their own personal list because everyone has different needs. So the first thing you need to do before you even take a step into the ocean is make sure you're legal. 
So learn all the rules and regulations at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife website. We call them ODFW. So don't go by what people tell you. Use the ODFW website to verify what's legal and not legal. The regulations can change annually and there are some seasonal changes. So stay up to date on all changes. Know what licenses and tags are needed for wherever you fish and what species you're fishing for. Make sure you're carrying a Lira license at all times. I usually carry a hard copy, but you can carry an electronic copy. Separate licenses are needed for different harvesting. For example, if you're crabbing and clamming. Know your saltwater restrictions, such as number of rods and number of hooks and other equipment limitations. Also no catch restrictions such as size and number. So here's a screenshot from the ODFW website. These are the different kind of licenses and tags that are available. You can also get combined hunting and fishing licenses. So do your homework and find the most cost effective solution for you and make sure you're getting the correct licenses and tags for whatever you're fishing at and for whatever species you're fishing for. You also need to learn about marine protected areas or MPAs. These are certain coastal areas which are protected and have harvest restrictions. There's multiple MPAs along the coast, so check all of them before you go. There are also different boat versus shore limitations, so do your research. And there's an occasional local beach closures for various reasons, so check that out. On the right hand side, you can see what an example of an MPA looks like. And if you go to the ODF web, ODFW website, you'll find them all. The other thing is make sure you park legally and ensure you know what fees are required for any day use and or parking when using state beaches or parks to avoid tickets and fines. Follow all laws and regulations, please. So obviously you want to be legal, but the number one priority you should have is always be safe. Folks down playing on the beach. Uh oh, I have time to go here. Get out of the way! Go! Whoa, that was that was scary. That's a big sneak away. My God, that's huge. I just got out of the way. It would have taken anybody in its path. Look at that. Holy, you know what? Everybody made it out. So after you're legal, safety should always be your number one focus. There are multiple rescues and deaths that occur each year on the Oregon coast. Never turn your back to the ocean and step carefully when wading in the beach. Look for rip currents and backwash so you don't get swept into the ocean. Look for large objects like trees, logs, seaweeds and rocks that you might trip on and that will take you down. If you wear waders, always wear a waist belt and I'll show you what that means to ensure your waders don't fill up with water if you go down. You can also wear a personal flotation device or PFD for maximum protection. There are also water, water activated ones that you can buy. You can also fish with somebody so you can watch each other and make sure each other stay safe. Have a way to communicate with 911 in case of an emergency. There are always coastal warnings about dangerous conditions so watch for these. And finally, always stay up the beach at first until you feel safe with the ocean forces. So whether you wear booted waders or stocking waders, the most important thing is to use the waist belt. What the waist belt does is when you cinch it tight and if you go down in the water, the water only fills to the waist belt level. So your legs don't fill up with water. It makes it very difficult to stand up if all your waders are completely full. My waders actually also have a chest string, 
so I actually have two layers of protection. I'll talk more about waders in video number two. If you want maximum protection, you can also wear a personal flotation device or PFD. On the left hand side, you can see it's a very simple one. And then there's a manual valve that you can pull on to inflate the vest. On the right hand side is actually a PFD that has tackle spaces integrated. And many anglers like to use this one because it's a two in one function. So I'll go over some basics, how to determine if it's safe. But again, it's up to you to determine for yourself whether it's safe for you. You need to find apps that will forecast swell, wave conditions, weather, and tide heights. Here's a few examples, but there are many others. Surfforecast.com, woollyweather.com, and magicseaweed.com. Look for the specific location you are going to when using these apps. The first thing you want to look at are swell conditions. What is most important is how powerful swells are, which translates to how hard you get hit. High swells with short frequency period is the highest risk situation. High swells mean more power. A five foot swell is gonna hit you a lot harder than a two foot swell. Short frequency means how fast the waves are coming at you. A five second versus a 10 second period means you'll get tw hit twice as often with a five second period. Using swell energy forecasts help determine safety more accurately than trying to estimate swell height and frequency period. I'll show you how to do that in a second. There's also the factor of how pleasant conditions are. So bring, you know, different clothes, hats and gloves for changing conditions. You know, obviously it's much funner to fish in sunny weather versus a driving rain. So what I have found is that wind speed over 10 miles per hour becomes unpleasant. Look at rain probability and the heaviness of the rain. It's a lot easier to fish in a drizzle versus a downpour. And temperature below 40 degrees makes your fingers hard to maneuver. So take that into account. So here's an example of how to use an app to determine the ocean conditions when you want to go. This is an app called surfforecast.com and it's the first app I always go to when I decide to go surf fishing. If you look in the red box, there's two red circles. On the left, you'll see a four, which means these are foot, four foot swells. And on the right, you'll see 7.5, which means 7.5 swells. In the green circles below them, you'll see the period. So you'll see 18 for four foot swells and nine for seven and a half foot swells, which means the seven and a half foot swells are coming in as twice as fast. But what I mainly focus in on is this red box, which is energy, which equates to the power of the swells coming in. So you can see the four foot swells at an 18 second period has a power of 959. At the seven and a half foot swells with a nine second period, you see it's a 63 power. So even though the seven and a half foot swells are almost twice as high as the four foot swells and are coming in twice as fast, the energy is lower. So if I had to choose between the two, I'd actually go at the seven and a half foot and nine second swell. But in either case, I wouldn't go in both cases because it's over 500. The other thing I look at on this app is the wind speed. So again, under 10 miles per hour is more comfortable and it shows you the wind direction and what it's coming from. So again, if the wind is coming from the west and in your face, it's gonna be more unpleasant than if the wind is to your back. The final thing this app will give you is the high tide and low tide times and depth. But what I found is that this app is not as accurate as other apps that I use. But this is the first app I come to, and then I go to two or three other apps to confirm the weather conditions. So right after I determine whether it's safe to go or not, I then look at the pleasantness of the conditions. 
I look at temperature, rain, and wind intensity of the energy. And your personal tolerance level for each determine how pleasant it's going to be for you. I always bring extra clothes and hats and gloves in my car for changing conditions. I actually carry a rain jacket in my backpack as well. So again, wind speed over 10 miles an hour starts becoming unpleasant. And a lot of it depends on what direction it's coming from and how cold it is. I don't usually go at temperatures below 40 degrees because it makes my fingers hard to maneuver and I can't bait my hooks very well. Many people avoid fishing in higher winds, like I said, in 10 miles an hour. And coming from the west is worse as it's in your face and then you're also casting into the wind. But with a good rain jacket and wind jacket, wind coming from these can be tolerable. And in terms of rain, high quality rain gear will protect you from the elements. And with your waders, you're in pretty good shape. Many will fish in the rain if it's light and moderate, as long as the wind is low. So here's what you can expect to catch on the surf. Most people will get red tail surf perch, silver surf perch, striped perch, and they also get a lot of crabs, believe it or not. So for miscellaneous species, you also get sculpins, flounders, and occasional salmon, cutthroat, or striped bass. So here are the various surf perch you can expect to catch. The most targeted surf perch that anglers go after in the coast are red tail surf perch. These are pretty easily identifiable by the fins that are pink or reddish color. So you also heard the term uh, pink fin and red fin. The other main perch you'll catch in the surf is a silver surf perch, but these are more silver and the fins are translucent. So it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the two by looking at the fins. These fish are also much smaller than red tail perch. The third perch you might get is a striped surf perch, and these are multicolored with blue stripes and they look like a rainbow. The size is between a red tail and a silver, but these tend to congregate in rocky areas more. So the other main thing you should look at when catching red tails is whether they're male and female. Obviously, we always wanna let females go so we can have future generations of fish. So a female has a straight anal fin that you can see on the left, and a male has an indented anal fin on the right. If you didn't know, female perch give live birth, so please release pregnant females so we can sustain the fisheries. The other thing you'll catch when you're surf fishing, believe it or not, are Dungeness crabs. So there's no keeping of females in Oregon, and here's how you can tell the difference between a male and a female, which is that a male on the underside has a very narrow apron. On the right-hand side, you can see a female has a very wide apron. So you need to carry a crab gauge to make sure that you're measuring correctly if you're gonna keep Dungeness crabs. Again, you can get miscellaneous species like sculpins, flounders, salmon, steelhead, cutthroat trout, striped bass, rock bass, and starfish occasionally when you're fishing. Bottom line, please be mindful that excessive harvesting harms future populations. So keep, only keep what you can consume. So in summary, make safety your number one priority once you're legal and don't take risks. Make sure you are compliant to all laws and regulations by going to the ODFW website. Please sustain the environment. Don't litter, use biodegradable plastics, and harvest responsibly. Look at weather and swell conditions to make the experience most enjoyable for yourself. Catches are varied and there are legal catches and limits are dependent on species, so make sure you understand what they all are. Watch part two of two to learn about the basics of how to catch in the surf. And I hope this video is informational for you.